Thank you, Health Subcommittee. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> Thank you, Health Subcommittee Chair Guthrie, Ranking Member Issue, members of the subcommittee. I'm a board-certified pediatrician and a specialist in adolescent and young adult health. I've spent 12 years in medical training and direct patient care and in clinical research. I'm honored to serve the diverse needs um, of young adults age 12 to 25. And as an assistant professor at the Yale School of Medicine, I teach medical residents, students, and fellows. I am also the co-founder of the Integrity Project for Child and Adolescent Health, which seeks to infuse health policy debate with scientific evidence. My testimony today reflects my academic and clinical work, as well as medical consensus, and not the views of my employer. The amendment to the Public Service Act before you proposes to defund pediatrics training programs throughout our country if these institutions provide the standard of care to transgender youth. I'm honored to speak here today on behalf of esteemed colleagues throughout the nation who provide this best practice medical care for children and youth, including trans youth and their families. As a physician with a commitment to patient care, I'm honored to be able to do more for them here than I can do in the office. The past few years mark a rapidly shifting and hostile political climate towards medical care for transgender people with a harsh focus on youth. Care that should be a private matter for families, patients, and providers is now being directed by legislators based on unsupported fears and misinformation. I understand that this care may be confusing to those who are not medical providers with expertise in treating this population or those who do not have a personal connection to a transgender person. That is why it is critical that this body base its decisions on facts and accurate information. Most of us here would not disagree with that. From my position as a medical practitioner and a member of a large community of experts in this care, I see five categories of misinformation. Denial of the medical condition of gender dysphoria. False claims about standard practice. False claims about the evidence that backs care. False claims about the safety of treatments and an attack on medical authority. And I'm here to ensure that you have the facts to address this misinformation. Gender dysphoria, the long-standing and significant distress that many transgender people have from the incongruence between their gender identity and the sex they have at birth, is real. It's a recognized and serious medical condition. Transgender people of all ages exist. Their healthcare is based on established standards of care and clinical practice guidelines, which are themselves based on substantial medical research and evidence, as well as decades of clinical practice. Based on these standards, youth and parents receive informed counseling about the risks and the benefits of specific treatments, and every major medical organization has endorsed this care. As a pediatrician, I must also address the proposed amendment. Pediatrics residencies and fellowships are the backbone of health care for children in this country. During the triple demic of influenza, COVID-19, and respiratory syncytial virus, also called RSV, it was pediatrics residents and fellows who worked every hour of every day to help children survive life-threatening respiratory diseases. They help NICU babies get to kindergarten. They keep outpatient clinics flowing so the kids get routine well care. Residents and fellows form a pipeline of research and innovation that makes this country a global leader in every area of pediatric medical science. This bill would require children's hospitals to deny kids health care to maintain funding. As a practical matter, there is no way to banish all transgender youth from children's hospitals, nor is there a way for pediatricians to simply refuse to provide these youth with medically necessary care. All kids suffer when their legislators remove parents' rights and prevent pediatricians from providing this standard of care. And I have to tell you, American pediatricians will not accept being told that they have to e leave even a single child behind. There's no room for clinic. Uh, there's no room in our clinics for the government. I had a conversation with a trans teen recently. Gender dysphoria began early in puberty and worsened as puberty progressed. Parents sought and received help. This family asked me to tell members of this committee that gender-affirming care gave their kid confidence. This teen stands tall, debates international law and model UN sessions, recently in this city, our capital, to compete in nationals. This care was life-saving life-affirming. 
College options are limited to states that protect trans health care, but even still, this teen is excited for the future that lies ahead. That's what every kid in this country deserves. Please don't make it harder for us pediatricians to get them there. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. The chair now recognizes Dr. Grossman for five minutes for your opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Guthrie. Oh. Chairman Guthrie and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to address you. My name is Miriam Grossman. I am a board certified child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist, author, and senior fellow at Do No Harm. I have been taking care of patients for 45 years. I'm going to use my time to respond to Dr. McNamara. First, I'm struck by her use of the phrase sex assigned at birth. Sex is not assigned at birth. Sex is established at conception and it's recognized at birth, if not earlier. Dr. McNamara claims that her views are science-based, but to claim that sex is assigned at birth is without any scientific basis whatsoever. Its language misleads people, especially children, into thinking that male and female are arbitrary designations and can change. That is simply not true. Dr. McNamara claims that social and medical interventions are the only evidence-based treatment and that scientific evidence shows it is life-saving. Without it, she's warning us, kids will commit suicide. Well, a growing number of countries have effectively banned the care to which she's referring. And thank God there's been no wave of suicides or other mental health catastrophes. Three years ago, Finland placed strict limitations on medical interventions for minors. Sweden did the same thing after a 14-year-old girl was found to have osteoporosis and spinal fractures from puberty blockers. An investigation concluded, quote, the risks of anti-puberty uh, and hormone treatment for those under 18 currently outweigh the possible benefits. The UK conducted a review and called the evidence very low. They've also placed severe restrictions on the care that Dr. McNamara calls life-saving. Norway also analyzed the data and has made similar changes in policy. The National Academy of Medicine in France warned, quote, great medical caution must be taken in children and adolescents given the vulnerability of this population and the many undesirable, even serious, complications the therapies cause. Doctors in New Zealand and Australia have published similar statements. Is Dr. McNamara suggesting that all these countries are rejecting evidence-based treatment and placing their kids at risk of suicide? Regarding that point of view, Finland's gender expert, Dr. Rita Kaltiela said, quote, it's purposeful disinformation the spreading of which is irresponsible. All seven countries, and Florida too, of course, concluded that kids don't need their development interrupted, the girls don't need their periods stopped and their voices lowered, and the boys don't need to grow breasts. What they need is psychotherapy. I have other objections to Dr. McNamara's testimony. She insists that her position, only hers, represents standard medical care. What she doesn't want you to know is that there is no standard. There's a debate. There's a fierce debate. And on the side opposite her stand such prominent figures as Stephen Levine, Kenneth Zucker, Paul McHugh, and James Cantor, among others. These doctors are giants in the field. They have been treating transgender patients and gathering data and publishing papers about them, and I mean no disrespect here, but since before Dr. McNamara was born. The point is that those veteran clinicians and others who have wisdom and experience are ignored because they disagree with the current narrative. They're against medical interventions for the same reason those seven countries are. There is no evidence of long-term benefit, but there is evidence of harm. 
I'll end by quoting Jamie Reed, the courageous whistleblower from the Children's Gender Clinic in St. Louis. I believe that that hospital receives the medical education funding that we're discussing today. She said that doctors at that clinic said, we are building the plane while we are flying it. We are building the plane while we are flying it. That's how they described the treatment at their gender clinic. Our precious tax dollars should not support such a perilous experiment. Thank you. Okay.